Welcome to our Long Beach Unified School District Board of Education uh, meeting. We will have our student board member from Poly High School lead us in a Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and face the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. And I will give you a more formal introduction shortly. Okay. We welcome those who are here for the purposes of addressing the board at the proper time and in the order of their request. If you wish, if you wish to speak, during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. I have the stack uh, here in front of me. You may also request to give testimony on an item not listed for discussion today. However, full discussion on any items not listed on the agenda will have to be delayed until such a time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. If you wish to ask questions, please address them to the chair and not to individual members of the board or staff. In closed session today, uh, in case NC060708, the board voted to approve a settlement agreement and release of all claims, the terms of which provide for consideration and release of claims. The roll call vote was unanimous and passed 4-0 with members Benitez, Kerr, Craighead, and Otto participating in the vote. This is the first time in a long time that the mask that I wore was not the good mask today because my glasses are really fucking up today. So it's either going to be foggy or I'm going to be blind if I go like this. Public hearing today, we have none. Um, call for agenda items for separate action, adoption of the agenda as posted. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Uh, S second. I'd like to request an amendment to the agenda. Yes. Um, we're requesting an amendment to resolution 120121-C. Um, this amendment changes a reference to Board of Education Areas or Board of Education Trustee Areas to Board of Education Districts to align with the term used in the city charter. This change is non-substantive in nature and does not alter or modify the proposed Board of Education District boundaries. Thank you, Ms. Takahashi. So just changing um, area to district. Correct. Um, let's do a new motion with the minor change in wording. Um, Ms. Craighead, do you want to give us a new motion? Yes. And then second? I, yeah. Second. Let's do a roll call vote. Mr. Otto? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so all that fanciness for uh, word change. Thank you, Ms. Takahashi. That passed 5-0. Now, approval of minutes. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mr. Otto? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so the minutes pass 5-0. Now, I get to introduce the coolest, brightest, smartest, best picker of which best university to attend in the world. <laughs> the pride and joy of Long Beach Unified School District, <laughs> Mia Yasamuro from Poly High School. Thank you for that. That was the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> that was amazing. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Baker, board members, LBUSD staff, and all of our LBUSD families. Thank you all for having me. My name is Mia Yasumura, and I'm a senior at Poly High School. I am here as a representative of our ASB and will be giving a brief report on our school activities as student body president. We started our school year with a lot of uncertainty concerning COVID-19 and how we may get our students back to school safely. With the guidance of your board members and our administration at Poly, we continue to safely keep our in-school learning available to us. We thank you all for this. Despite, all being in a, despite still being in a pandemic, we continue to provide our students with opportunities to serve the community 
and have fun activities while maintaining safety measures. During our fall semester, our commissioner of organizations, Paige Zwerner, organized a fantastic homecoming week. With the help of our amazing campus clubs, we were able to reignite the spirit here at Poly. Highlighting our annual HOCO Fair, dress up days, and our exciting Tradition Lives On football game versus Wilson High School. Thank you, board mem thank you board members Eric Miller and Dr. Juan Benitez for joining us that evening. At the start of November, we successfully put on our Sadie Hawkins dance, which had sold out and hosted over a thousand people in attendance. Students got to enjoy themselves with our amazing DJ, karaoke booth, and so much more. Thank you to our local food vendors that provided students with such delicious options. Throughout the month, we also had our annual Thanksgiving drive, led by our Commissioner of Organizations, Rian Kin. With the collaboration from our amazing clubs, we were able to donate over 70 boxes of canned food items to the Long Beach Rescue Mission. We finished up November participating in the High School Choice Fair at Cabrillo High School. The turnout, event, the turnout for this event was high in poly spirit, with many students and teachers representing and promoting their program. Thank you to the CIC teachers and my fellow peers for helping me to promote such a wonderful program to our incoming eighth graders. To spread some holiday cheer, ASB will ho be hosting our annual holiday project, led also by our Commissioner of, Organi Commissioner of Outreach, Rianne Kin. We're preparing craft activities for the youth in our surrounding community and collecting toys on campus. On the day of our event, we'll be providing donated wrapped toys to the kids ages one to 13, facilitate fun craft activities, serve refreshments, and provide amazing entertainment from our jazz combo, cheer, and many more. Last but not least, we cannot forget about our incredible athletes at Poly. Both boys water polo and girls tennis won the CIF Southern State Championships, the first boys water polo championship since 1929, and the first girls championship ever. Finally, our football program won their CIF Southern Se Section Championship last week, solidifying an incredible showing from our Moore League and City Schools. Shout out to Compton High School, St. Anthony High School, and our Atlantic Avenue Sister School, Jordan High School, for their success this season. I am looking forward to attending our state Southern Regional football game this Saturday against Gardena Sarah High School. Go Jackrabbits! <laughs> <laughs> our final upcoming event that we are excited to partake in is the opportunity to host our site night for our community, happening on December 15th at 6 p.m. We are planning to have our marching band, cheer, vocal jazz group, GROTC, Pacific Islander group, athletic teams, and campus clubs to help with poly spirit, while focusing on our pathway presentations by our, student, our teachers and admin team. I would like to thank you, Mr. Salas, best principal, <laughs> for all that you do on our campus, and I thank you all again so much for allowing me to report for our campus activities and for your continued support. How about a second round of applause for our scholar athletes from Poly uh, this year that have so much to be proud of. Uh, so Mia, you have an awesome introduction to live up to. Um, <laughs> wondering what your plans are upon uh, graduation. Upon graduation. So if I do get into my dream school. Which What's your I dream school? Say it for uh, my dream the school, viewing public. I'm saying it right now, is UCLA. <laughs> UCLA <laughs> is my dream school. <laughs> so if I do get into my dream school, I would like to study biology or biochemistry to become a dermatologist because I've, ver I've been very interested in studying skin because a lot of my friends struggle with acne and like skin uh, related problems and I would like to help them because I know it's like, I don't know, like having insecurities is very hard, especially through high school. So I just, that was one of my interests and in, um, careers. So I'm hearing both undergrad and medical school at UCLA, is that what? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> um, thank you for being here, Mia. I'm gonna open it up uh, to any of our other board members here that if they wanna make a plug for their own college or university. <laughs> I don't want to make a plug for that, but if you could work on wrinkles, I'm right behind you. <laughs> yes. I got you. I got you. There's your first client right there, Amelia. <laughs> I'll let you know when I get a degree. Uh, Mia, you're more than welcome to join us, but we know it's a school night, so if you have to excuse yourself, we totally understand, and thank you for being here and presenting again tonight. Yes, thank you again. I'm so honored to be here. 
I was a little bit nervous, but the environment here is just so welcoming, and I just thank you guys for that. So we should invite a bunch of other folks to come out and join us, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to come again. <laughs> Great, we'd love to have you. Thank you. So we are moving on to recognitions and acknowledgments. Our student staff and school celebrations, I believe we have a video with Daniel Rodriguez. Hi, I'm Daniel Rodriguez, a student here in the Merritt Pathway at Lakewood High School. I went to Garfield Elementary School in the Long Beach Unified School District. I went to Stevens Middle School, and now I'm attending Lakewood High School. I had played baseball for all my life, from like four to 14, and I did not like it. And then when I came to Lakewood here, I joined the tennis program, and I enjoyed it, but I don't know, I just felt like it wasn't me. I felt like I was doing something because I was expected to. So I had always wanted to join the cheer team, but I was sort of afraid from being different or being looked at weird or kind of judged because that was a part of me I was always like pushing down. But I'm so proud of like actually taking that leap and trying out for the team because it has like revealed a new side of me that I kind of didn't know of. This school district is very diverse and I would say sometimes it can be harder for me within society to fit in, but I always felt welcomed within my classes by my teachers and by students. Well, I'm graduating soon. Uh, my dream school is UC Berkeley or UC San Diego, and I hope to go into the political science field and become either a house representative or like an immigration lawyer, because I really like being inclusive and I like caring for people who are like not as represented within our society. As a student within the Long Beach Unified School District, I would say I've learned to be accepting and caring of everybody. I've learned to always have an open mind and to always be inclusive and understanding. That's why I try to keep my like eyes and arms open at all times and just watch out for other people. Poli Sci, one of the coolest majors that I know of. <laughs> um, we're going to move into public testimony on items listed on the agenda. Uh, Leticia, was this all that we um, had, the ones that were handed to me? Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Suarez, can you call our first speaker? Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Right. Good evening. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, please forgive the scripted nature of my comments this evening. Um, I uh, did not originally intend to uh, speak until just about a day and a half ago. So. Um, but good afternoon and thank you so much for your willingness to hear me speak and for having the public comment uh, section. I do appreciate it. My name is Patrick Galogli and I've been teaching in the Long Beach Unified School District for going on 28 years now. And I know what you're thinking. How could you be uh, that old? You look so youthful. Um, well, I understand, yes, but I am actually that old, but who knew? I'm also a parent of three boys that have gone through the system uh, and a foster daughter, actually, that graduated last year. And for uh, eight wonderful years at the very beginning of my career, I taught at Stevens Middle School, the pride of the West Side, where I fell in love with the pr profession uh, to which I've dedicated so much of my life. In those days, we had uh, the uh, Air Quality Management District on speed dial in the main office. Due to our close proximity of the refineries of Wilmington, the 710 and 405 freeways, and the wider port pollution of trucks and trains and large container vessels. In some of my classes, it seemed more students brought inhalers than pencils, and we trained in staff meetings to assist students in respiratory distress due to the high rate of asthma on our west side campus. After a brief stint in an east side uh, K-8 school, I managed to land at the crown jewel of the Long Beach Unified School District, Long Beach Poly, go Jackrabbits, where I have been for the last 18 years. Last year, I was honored to become one of the quiet adult supporters behind a group of dedicated, driven, mature, fiercely intelligent and unfailingly optimistic students in the Green Schools campaign. I've been so impressed with their attempts to build this coalition of students, parents, teachers, administrators, green technology contractors, and other community stakeholders and district officials in developing a realistic vision of how to commit this district to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Likewise, I am so thankful that we have been able to have such productive and respectful dialogues with board members, district officials, and even city administrators. We all understand that this is an ambitious goal and that costs and budgets and timelines are much more complicated than a soundbite that can fit on a protest sign. 
But after seeing the resolution, I know that we can do this, that we must do this, and that our whole city will benefit as a result. Innovation is being spurred around the world to improve green technology, green fuels, cut emissions, and eliminate waste. And there's so much work still left to do. But we can't fix the whole world. We can, however, do our part. I believe this to be a great opportunity to do so. Long Beach Unified has always been a leader, and this is such an important time for us to lead. Please pass this resolution. Let's see this commitment through together. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And just for clarification, we are hearing public testimony on items listed on the agenda. Ro uh, Robert Hamilton? Good evening, welcome. Hello. Hi, my name is Robert Hamilton. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm here to talk about the uh, Wilson High School new aquatic center and specifically the co-ed locker room. Uh, hang on, my glass is fogging up because of this mask and it's cold out here. So bear with me. Okay, uh, first of all, I believe it to be a huge safety issue. It places our children and teachers at risk. You know, why are you intentionally putting my daughter at a greater risk? Much greater risk than other schools in our same league or district. Cabrillo has separate locker rooms in their aquatic center. They have separate gender locker rooms, boys and girls. Why would we not be equitable, big word for you, and give Wilson and the rest of the district the same safety concerns and courtesy? You know, as a father of a 15-year-old sophomore girl, I absolutely am against co-ed locker rooms. It takes one child, and you know one child will do something stupid, like take a photo or make a disparaging comment against a classmate put it on social media, it goes viral, and it will drastically change the lives of those two kids. You put the teachers in a horrible position of being accused of sexual assault, whether it be true or not. They will be fired, or at minimum, they'll be looked at as if they did do it by their peers and their other students. The threat of lawsuits alone should be enough to stop this. Who will keep out the pedophiles out? Will there be security guards at the doors? Criminals do not follow the rules. My daughter's a very competitive swimmer. She's vying for the Olympic team. She's swimming this summer in Israel in the Maccabi game. She's be for Team USA. It was that she swam at Rose Bowl Aquatics. We were there two years ago. There was a pedophile, went in the locker room, sodomized a young boy. This happens all over public pools. Predators, you know, um, you know, why can't that happen here? What's to stop a predator from coming in and raping a child in a beautiful air-conditioned locked stall from ceiling to floor with a one-inch gap? Cabrillo has had issues, sexual assault. USA Swimming is full of predators. USA Gymnastics full of predators. We have to protect the health and safety of our children. Today is the first step, and I'm asking you, I'm begging you, to do the right thing, not the politically correct thing, but these type of bathrooms, inclusive co-ed locker rooms. All you have to do is build a dividing wall and you have separate locker rooms. You can have the middle portion for any transgender, anything else. They've talked about transgender, they've talked about ADA, they already have Thank you, access. your three minutes are up, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Suarez is our next speaker, Tracy Myers. Okay. Hi, welcome. Good evening. 
um, you'll have to excuse this. It's hard sometimes to, to talk through my mask. My name's Tracy Myers. I am a licensed architect and a former uh, Long Beach swimmer at Wilson. I was varsity three years and a captain. Um, I also work for the state of California enforcement office, so I provide opinions on uh, architectural standard of care. Um, I know that we all want the best aquatic facilities possible for Wilson and for the Long Beach School District. Um, and I'm here to provide you with comments, you know, on my analysis of the current design. Um, we have time proven locker room designs that have been used for decades. And I know that now we have some inclusive, we have inclusivity goals and we have different design goals um, that need to be accommodated. And really I think that we can accommodate the functionality requirements that we need in terms of the quantity of swimmers and also be respectful and responsive to the inclusive requirements by installing um, private stalls and such. So um, I've communicated with the district. I've had conversations with DSA um, and other stakeholders on these issues. Um, the current design, I think, is grossly undersized. Um, I'm very concerned about the size. Um, currently, there are 109 showers in the, both of those um, locker rooms. What's proposed is 10. That's less than 10% of the current capacity. Proposed, we have 30 toilets. I'm sorry, current, we have 30 toilets and urinals. Proposed, we have around nine. That's 30% of the current capacity. Um, you know, just from a functionality standpoint, that doesn't work. You know, we know what works. Um, you know, we used to swim in those locker rooms and utilize them. So I'm just very concerned about that. Um, and I also identified what I think may be a code violation. Um, there are five large windows that open up from the offices directly into the locker rooms. Chapter 31.5 of the California Building Code um, talks about this and has this provision in it for privacy for ancillary areas. Um, and even though students are not gonna be naked outside of these stalls, we all were in high school. <laughs> we understand. You're gonna pull a towel, you're gonna you know, goof around. Um, it's a very risky endeavor, uh, and that concerns me quite a bit. I sent that to DSA for their review. Um, let's see. <sighs> so I understand it's so, it's so important to make sure that everybody feels comfortable and can use these facilities. But you know, we have a world-class swimming organization. Um, Long Beach is world-class. Wilson has a world-class. And these designs, you know, the Wilson design is gonna be prototype. These are gonna be in our community for decades. And we really do need to get that design right. And even if- Thank you, your time is up. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank for you. My and we did receive your documentation. We have it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. I will. Good evening. Nice Welcome. Hey, good evening. My name is Katie Rowe. Um, I'm here to discuss the proposed co ed locker rooms plan for our swimming facilities and Wilson High School. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, I'm a former Wilson swimmer. I'm in the Wilson Hall of Fame. I'm a 10-time All-American. I won CIF six times. I swam at UCLA. I've coached as a volunteer at Wilson for the past nine years. And I swim and coach for a local master's team. I'm very active and engaged in Southern California swimming. I'm intimately familiar with swim facilities and best practices, as you may imagine. Uh, Co-ed locker rooms are unsafe for students and faculty. Long Beach Unified already does a great job allowing students to use the facility of their choice. We will lose swimmers to outside our district if we go with this plan. It's guaranteed. I already hear parents talking about it. Individual stalls plus open areas in a single gender locker room are the best solution to accommodate all. It appears the designers are unfamiliar with the specific nature of aquatic facility locker rooms, so I'd like to touch on that. There's been talk of tech suits. This is a tech suit. I'm not here to sell you suits, just so you know. For those of you not familiar, our girls wear these and boys, but our girls wear ones that look like this at a couple major competitions per year. The seams on these are fused, they're not sewn. So if you poke through them, they're done. They're basically trash. 
These cost $400 to $600 a piece. We have kind of a lending library of these. It takes our girls about 20 minutes to put one on, and one or two girls actually have to help them. It's very slow. A dual meet would have 100 to 120 girls putting these on after warm-up all at the same time. There is not room to do this in a co-ed locker room with stalls. I truly believe this is a Title IX issue of not giving adequate access to females to change for a, an event. This facility has a lot of problems. The stall doors encourage poor behavior and are not able to be supervised with the floor to ceiling doors. We could have drug use, suicide, self-harm, assault. Uh, there's no benches. Locker room floors are wet by their very nature. When stalls are full, that's a problem. Girls have, and boys have big bags, musical instruments. Putting on pants in stalls. We actually stand on the benches to put our pants on because otherwise your pants drag on the floor. The stall doors with me standing on a bench will be this high, which means I can look into the next stall. Showers with uh, changing take about 15 minutes. There's no way to get 54 PE, PE athletes or 250 athletes through. Students will leave a stall to go to another changing stall so everyone can get through. There's also been no outreach to Wilson parents or coaches regarding these locker rooms. All of these problems are fixed with stalls and open space single sex lockers plus inclusive accessible spaces. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Yeah, so I'm Paul Evans. Um, I'd like to talk on multiple items, but uh, we'll see. I don't need three minutes for each, but looks like probably take more than three minutes to talk about all of them. First one is 18-1, Board's Policy 415, uh, Excellence and Equality Equity Policy. I say it should not be adopted. The idea of equity is misguided. It should we strive for uh, we should strive for equality, not of opportunity, not outcome. This policy institutes discrimination based on physical characteristics. Its goal to end alleged systemic racism is being instituted by <laughs> instituting systemic racism against non-people of color. It does the opposite of the civil rights movement to end systemic racism with the goal to judge people by their character, not their skin color. In the implementation section, you could say you look at number two, there's a differentiation of support based on race. And number five is a focus on people of color. And number seven, and budget expenditures are particularly for people of color. And number nine, priority hiring based on physical characteristics. Now, it institutes racism by the own definition in the glossary. This is racial prejudice plus power. The power aspect is based on the relationship of the authority granted through social structures over groups and individuals. This is exactly what you guys are trying to implement here. Another one, is the establishes systemic racism, uh, oppression, as defined in your own policy here. Oppression by an institution or systemic oppression when the laws in place create unequal treatment of a specific social identity group or groups. That's exactly what this policy does. This, this policy should not be adopted. And going on to item 19.1, non-discrimination programs and activities. It changes the wording to allow discrimination of someone who is not in a protected group, that is, protected, a group protected by law. It also establishes equity, not equality, as the standard. Equity, by your own definition here, promotes inequality of treatment. 
And the same would be for item 19.3, non-discrimination and harassment. Same thing, changes the wording to allow discrimination if someone is not in a protected group. And 19.4, this, um, I could say the pool being a maximum Thank depth you, of seven Thank you, your three feet. minutes are up. Okay, I cannot address. Thank you, sir, your time is up. Good evening, Hi. welcome. I'm here to address some non-discrimination issues that people don't generally think about. And one of the issues has to do with non-binary students. In sex segregated facilities, when people come across someone that they perceive is of a gender that they weren't expecting, especially if either party is nude, they can be upset and potentially dangerous. Now, this can be addressed in one of two ways. One way is to just require no nude clothing compulsory in all locker rooms. That's one way to address it. And the other way to address it is to just give people advance notice. Here's an example of something that you could use. In sex segregated facilities, if you just had a sign like this, it just makes people think about it that it's not just a male or female locker room, that could be someone else, and that symbol is a non-binary gender. This would be a simple solution. It would provide people advance notice. It would also make the few students who are growing in number who are identifying as non-binary feel more comfortable going into those rooms. The other issue I'd like to address is that of the unvaccinated people. Now, we don't generally think of that as non-discrimination because we think it's entirely their choice. We don't think of it as you know, something that's part of their identity. But I would like you to point out that there are many people, either because of a bias towards nature or because of a deep-seated distrust towards the government, the pharmaceutical industry, they don't feel comfortable going where we haven't gone before with new technology in the vaccines. These people are willing to give up their jobs. They're willing to give up their schools. And as a society, it doesn't make sense to not identify them as a group that we cater to. Now, you may want to take any safety measures you have to for the rest of the people, but please do not ignore this minority because they are part of our society. And whatever we can do to accommodate them, to make sure that they have access to, to a way to make a living, make sure they have access to a way to get schooling, that would be really good. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Suarez, before Mr. Suarez, before we move on to um, items not listed on today's agenda, I wanted to clarify that um, the public testimony that we heard today is actually not on our agenda. Uh, we will provide more clarification as to what item 19.4 is about, uh, but uh, we are not taking action on the items that were um, in public testimony uh, today. So wanted to clarify that as we get to our non-agenda uh, items. Uh, Fatima or Fatima? Good evening, welcome. Thank you, all right. So um, my name is Fatima. I'm coming to you here as a mom, as an educator, um, as a community member and as a delegate for, you know, Assembly District 64, which includes part of Long Beach. Um, I'm, but I'm standing here, you know, just as an ally in solidarity with the Green Schools campaign. Um, thank you so much to the school board for being willing to, you know, work on the resolution for the students. It means a lot. Um, just wanted to speak on the fact that the city of Long Beach, you know, faces the highest ozone pollution rates in the entire country and significant air quality issues due to the refineries that are in the area, including one near where I live. Um, and you know, my experience living near a refinery is that this impacts a lot of the lowest income people living in your city, a lot of, the, a lot of people of color living, and it's a way that we have systemic racism, classism, environmental racism perpetuate. Um, and so, you know, the call to action I, I wanted to say is that, you know, um, our youth shouldn't be here speaking on this, right? They are, 
but they they shouldn't they shouldn't be here right and we we I, my hope is that you know uh the school board uh will continue to act swiftly on this issue of doing their part in transitioning our schools because they are one of the biggest contributors um even though i mentioned the refineries right it's all connected environmental racism is all connected and it's important in whatever role we have whether we're a mom an elected official a community member doesn't matter we need to do our role where we can to tackle climate change um and so i'm here in support of that um and hope that you know we can get long beach as a city with all the stakeholders here to 100 percent uh clean energy in the very near future not the distant future thank you thank you Conrad should be next, right, Mr. Suarez? Conrad? Okay. Good evening, welcome. Hello, LBUSD Board of Education. My name is Conrad Schreiber, and I am a junior attending Long Beach Polytechnic High School. Today, I wanted to speak a little about oil refineries. Oil refineries are a major source of air pollution, not only for the people that live around them and work in them, but also they release chemicals that cause cancer, reproductive harm, uh, breathing problems, birth defects, and other health problems that affect us all. Of course, and, almost, and this almost goes without saying, but one of the greatest issues associated with oil refineries is that they are a major source of greenhouse gases that are warming our planet. And living in the city of Long Beach, we are surrounded by oil refineries. Oil refineries in Long Beach, Carson, and the LA area, including the Marathon Los Angeles Refinery, the Valero Wilmington Refinery, the Los Angeles Refinery, Carson, the uh, Tesoro for refineries, the Chem Oil Corporation, and the Phillips 66 refinery. They all emit toxic and dangerous pollutants that our students, teachers, staff, parents, and community breathe in. As a cross-country runner, I run at Signal Hill overlooking the entire city, which provides a view of the smog that coats the air that we breathe. Sometimes it's scary to think that this is the air that I breathe every day. And the thing is, our district uses the fossil fuels created by those refineries. We are supporting these refineries and thus polluting our communities, environment, lungs, and on and on. Thank you, and please continue to work with us, the Long Beach Green Schools campaign, to transition LBUSD off of fossil fuels. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, welcome. Good evening, my name is David Cepeda. You can start, David. Okay. Um, hi, I'm David, I'm a Long Beach resident and a supporter of the youth-led environmental movement. I find, the, I find these young people to be inspiring and uh, growing up in LA, in LA County, I've dealt with asthma all of my life. Growing into adulthood, I've come to learn how refineries and every aspect of the oil industry have led to my poor have led to poor health in my community and others that is to say that the bad air that i've known my whole life is affecting everyone who breathes it as well i've come to understand that not only does air pollution greatly affect children's lungs as they are developing but this smog pollution goes on to warm the planet and it will affect all of our future as a member of Sunrise Movement Long Beach, we express our adamant support for the Long Beach Green, Green Schools campaign. I believe these youth organizers are demonstrating courage by demanding a firm commitment to 100% 100 renewable energy. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I guess that, that'll be all, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, welcome. Uh, hi, good evening, uh, members of the school board. My name is Elliot Gonzalez. I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Sierra Club. I'm with Sierra Club, my generation. Uh, I'd like to speak in support of uh, the Long Beach Green Schools campaign. Uh, I think that these youth are doing probably one of the most important thing that, things that young people can be doing at this time. 
They are making a claim to their future. They know that if they are going to inherit a habitable and healthy planet, they must take up the important task of moving this world away from fossil fuels to clean energy, power from the wind and the sun. These youth know that, they, that the very future of life on this earth, as we know it, requires an immediate and just transition off of dirty energy. They know that the polluting refineries and gas plants contribute to adverse health effects such as cancer and asthma in Long Beach and in nearby communities. They are willing to stand up to these highly profitable industries in the name of clean air, in the name of their future. The Green Schools campaign has the support of the community and they make their demands that, the school, that their school district support the transition to 100% renewable energy. They know a school district can make a major impact by selecting clean energy to its schools, uh, to power its schools. These youth know that the battle for clean energy goes far beyond the school district, but they know as students they have every right to demand that their school district do its part. They have the support of Sunrise Movement Long Beach, Sierra Club My Generation, and even members of the city council. But what's most important is the question, will they have your support? Will you listen to the voices of the young people fighting for the future, or will you maintain the status quo? I believe the, youths, I believe the youth are the future, and I'm here to say that I believe in them. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Welcome, uh, my name is Michelle Lyons and I am running for Congress for this district here in Long Beach. And I'm here today to talk about both the mandates and talk about gender neutral restrooms. You know, I'm a mother first before I'm anything else. And I have kids that are three and four years old. And for the last 20 months, they have been mandated to wear a mask, which is absolutely ridiculous given the sense that kids play in sand and have all kind of things from bacteria and so forth that they're constantly exposed to, but yet they have to wear a mask every single day. I'm also here because of the gender neutral uh, restrooms or locker rooms. You know, as a 40 year old woman, I don't like to get naked in front of anybody, you know, and I can't imagine little kids that are 17, 18, 16, 15, 14 years old with raging hormones getting in, it, being with opposite sex, coming right out of the swimming area, being in the same changing facility. Where are the adults in the room? Where are the parents in the room? Our job as parents is to protect the innocence of children. That's our first job, is to protect them and their innocence. And what's going on in LA County right now, all of the politicians should be ashamed of themselves. We are ripping children's innocence away from them and we are not protecting them and we are not governing them. And so I am here, obviously I'm running for Congress because I'm very passionate about this, but I am here to fight for children and to protect their innocence. And I'm here to talk about these mandates because we have no science to show that children, especially three and four year olds, are at high risk for getting COVID and it should have been, these mandates should have been taken away a long time ago. So I'm, I hope that the governor and everybody else in the state is waking up because the trauma that these kids are gonna have to go through from having had masks on for such a young age, my kids were one and two when they started wearing masks every single day. You see what I'm saying? And it hurts my heart, especially because they're dirty, they're breathing in all this bacteria and everything else. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. And it just seems like no one with a brain is actually running our government. You know, it's a tyranny and it's sad. You know, and now we're talking about putting co-ed teenagers with raging hormones in the same locker room, getting changed. It, it, just, it just saddens me that, that, um, that uh, politics has gone so far into basically hurting children, you know, and that's where we all fail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Matt Lovendusky. It's good to uh, good to be back. I hope 
Thanksgiving was well spent by everybody. I uh, was here, or am here today, to ask a few questions about mass mandates. Um, specifically, when are we expecting the mask mandates to be lifted? What is the plan? What is the metric that is being employed so that we can uh, eliminate the mask mandate? For the studies being used in those metrics, who is the control group? Which school are we using or classrooms are we using as the control group? Are we looking at the studies from Norway? Are we looking at studies from Sweden? Are we looking at studies from Florida? Are there any studies being conducted on how the masks are impacting the ESL community? in schools, the size of the virus. Do we know the size of the virus? Do we know the efficacy of the masks based on the size of this virus? How many people have been fit tested uh, with their masks? Are we using N95s? I haven't seen any of the N95s in the schools. And are we connected to the idea of first doing no harm. I really think this is harming kids, folks. I don't think this is good for anybody. And maybe the information you have is more robust than the information that I have. And if so, I uh, would really appreciate if it is shared with those of us in the community dealing every day with kids that are suffering through these mask mandates. Um, I ask that, uh, that we do what we can to find it inside ourselves to love our children more than we fear a germ. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for the time of the folks out there beyond the drawn shades. Thank you for helping us hold the line. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, uh, Long Beach Board of Education. My name is Enrique Chavez. I am the Unit A uh, VP for uh, Long Beach Chapter 2, CSEA. I'm here to speak on a non-agenda item, which is negotiations. Again, I'm here because your negotiating team keeps putting the blame on the board for not authorizing the raise for classified. Um, something that you guys should have gotten is at least 1,200 emails from the community um, to each and every one of your emails in support of our raise. Again, it's hard to negotiate when your team claims they are not authorized by you to move. That's not negotiating. Uh, we would like to share with you that we also have a CSEA budget analysis team. Our team ran the numbers and the forecast presented by your CBFO of a doom and gloom is simply a tactic to convince you, the board, that there is no way the district can survive financially uh, with a $1.8 billion budget. Uh, that is a, a, a big question. So again, um, uh, the doom and gloom scenario always comes down to classified salaries. Uh, again, that is really strange for CSEA and its members. So again, uh, plain and simple, someone is playing math games to convince you, the board, that you guys are broke, again, when it comes to classified salaries. CSEA also took note of the bus driver strike that recently happened. Even though the bus drivers are not district employees, we supported their cause for the cost of living raises. If only 100 bus drivers cause that much strain on the district, imagine if your essential employees did something similar. Can you imagine? Please don't misunderstand, but we are here for our students, teachers, and community as well. I will end my speech with some fun trivia. CSEA recently conducted a poll, and 60% of the classified employees voted to that they would be willing to strike. Another 20% said that they were undecided. Again, this is just a recent poll that we wanted to share with you guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.
Good evening, welcome. Good evening, my name is Elvira Vasilyeva. I'm the mom of a student at Wilson High, Dooley Elementary, and five years old at daycare. I want to say that stop torturing our children. Masks are useless rack that doesn't not protect children. Children are used to wearing masks, you say. Yes, children will get used to wear anything if adults tell them so. They can get used to anything because an adult teacher is an authority for them. If a PE teacher tells a child to put on a mask and run in it, then child, even a teenager, will do it. Dozens of studies show that masks accumulate bacteria around the mouth. And children do not get enough oxygen. My kids have headache after the school every day. Researchers also show that babies who lip read more have better language skills when they are older. So wearing a face mask will affect young children's speech and language development. This is what I tell you as a mom of an English learner kid. Florida Middle School of more than 900 unmasked students have never had any COVID cases. It doesn't take a lot of will or energy to write laws and promote them to the masses. Just do what you are told. To listen to the voice of reason, conscience, truth, we should have inner freedom, independence, and critical attitude. In fear, people lose their minds. Forcing children to wear a mask is loss of sense. Either you are all in fear, or you are deliberately abusing our children. If you really worry about the health of our children, then basic hygiene rules are enough. Ventilate the classes, wash hands, leave children with cold symptoms and fever at home. And also, finally, establish healthy food at schools. What do you feed our children with? Pizza, hot dogs, fresh fruits, vegetables, and vitamins guarantee children's health, but not dirty face mask on their faces. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Suarez, I have uh, this person as our last speaker tonight, is that correct? Thank you. Okay. Hi there. Good evening, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you, my uh, name's Myron Nickerson. Person? And I am here not as a teacher, though I could be, I suppose, and not Sir, as. Just want to remind you about your mask. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, I, I didn't. I was not aware. So, thank you. I appreciate the safety. Um, anyway, I come here as a parent uh, of one of these green children out there. Um, and I, I, I'm not much of an activist, so I've been uh, a student and a teacher and a parent uh, my pretty much my whole life in Long Beach Unified, and I'm very proud to be uh, a member of the community. And I also understand that this, in these terribly contentious times, how uh, leadership in education has been under such duress, and I honor what you do in your service. My brother's a superintendent himself, and you know he's he's experienced all the ups and downs of this pandemic. But I do know, as an educator and now as a parent of a 13 and 11 year old who attend uh, middle school, that if we don't take care of the future that we're supposedly preparing these children for if we don't truly take action and immediate action, at least to get the ball rolling in the direction that these children are requesting. And I, again, I spent the holiday speaking with my brother, who's a, a, just a superintendent of a high school district, but understands the challenges of making any monumental shifts. But as every child that's come in here today will tell you and every child I've taught in the last five or six years, the time is now. There is no future without an earth that is sustainable and without energy that's sustainable and clean, 
we're just setting them up for a very well-educated group of survivors in an environment that's really not hospitable. So we have issues already with a port that pours toxins. You know, I taught it Cabrillo for a long time and noticed the dust every Monday morning that filled the cracks of the pavement from the port, the, uh, you know, the coke dust and the, and the industrial dust. We have issues. We can do what we can to work with the port. We can do what we can to make our energy oil, less oil dependent. And then hopefully we'll give these kids a great future to thrive in, not just survive in. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public testimony on items not listed on the agenda. Uh, as always, I want to thank the community members that have come out to provide public testimony. Um, we appreciate the effort and the courage that it takes to come to our board meetings, and we will continue encouraging our community members to provide public testimony, uh, communicate with us, engage with us uh, around the business that our school board and district conduct. I am going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is our staff report on educator effectiveness block grant. Ms. Takahashi, sure. could you provide some context? Sure. Um, um, would you like to start? I was going to ask, just for a point of clarification, to ask Mr. Miranda to provide just a source of information for some of the questions and some of the concerns that were expressed tonight. If that's okay, President Benitez. Yes, and, I, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I was just under the uh, understanding that when we got to item 19.4 uh, that we would provide the clarification, but we, we can do it here okay. as well. So, Mr. M Miranda, I referenced at the end of the first part of public uh, testimony that the uh, public testimony that we heard um, isn't on the agenda uh, tonight, and specifically uh, public testimony referenced item 19.4, so uh, please feel free to provide some clarification as to what we're taking action on tonight and what we're not taking action on uh, tonight. That's correct. So item 19.4 specifically relates to a product uh, with respect to this pool. So with the pool project over at Wilson High School, it, it includes a number of things, right? The pool deck, the bleachers, um, the mechanical equipment as well. Yet this particular product that I'll be speaking to in 19.4 is strictly the, the shell, the tub, in a sense that will fill with water. So it's that particular product that we're looking to specify for both Wilson and Lakewood High School Aquatic Centers. And again, just to be clear, not related to locker rooms, uh, bathrooms, uh, the facilities that were mentioned today. That's correct. Okay, thank you, Mr. Miranda. Can you also provide information about where the public can access resources on school bonds? You yes, beat me to it, Dr. Baker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, th thank you both. Uh, so with respect to additional information, um, on this matter. Uh, we now have an updated presentation that we've uploaded. It's a presentation that we shared with the Wilson community via a community meeting just last night. So we've updated the slide deck and posted that on our lbschoolbonds.net webpage. Uh, if folks visit that webpage, they can click on Wilson High School Aquatic Center and, and find the presentation link itself. Uh, there's also information there linked uh, with respect to our frequently asked questions um, file. So folks can click on that link and find that information. If you go to the primary homepage for the district, um, lbschools.net, you can click on the actual hard hat link or icon and it gets you to that page as well. And again, Mr. Miranda, we're not taking action on the items in that presentation. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. So um, now let's move on okay. to staff report, Ms. Takahashi. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'm happy to take this opportunity to provide information on an upcoming board agenda item that we'll have before you on December 15th. It's approval of a plan for the educator affecting this block grant. And so this is one of the streams of funding that was included in the state budget for 21-22. And we like to provide, to provide a wider context in terms of the learning acceleration and support plan. So we always like to ground um, our conversations about budget in the learning acceleration and support plan. So this is our comprehensive plan to address the needs, um, the academic needs of our students, as well as the socio-emotional needs of our students 
It's transparent and prioritizes community engagement and continuous improvement. Um, and you've seen this slide many times. Um, this is our general fund budget broken out into different levels of funding, starting with our local control funding formula as its base, state grants and entitlements above that, federal grants and entitlements above that, and then local grants and entitlements above that. And the learning acceleration and support plan really spans um, all um, three um, levels of funding. Um, and so we've essentially braided and leveraged different funding sources to support the plan. And we've, we've utilized the feedback from multiple engagement efforts um, to inform not only the learning acceleration and support plan, but also the local control accountability plan, the extended learning opportunities plan that we had you adopt, as well as the ESSER, which is a federal stimulus plan, and as well as this educator effectiveness block grant. So from the various surveys, the various meetings that we've conducted on budget, this ongoing dialogue with the community will really continue to inform our efforts and the plans that we will have before you. This educator effectiveness block grant is a one-time allocation to the district of four a little over $14 million. It expires in June 30th, 2026. Um, even though it expires in 2026, uh, we're required to have a plan adopted by December 20th of this year. And the uh, allowable uses is really to improve um, the teaching practice as well as uh, others who support students. So it, very broad um, in its allowable uses. And so what we will do is really leverage that really far off um, sunset date um, to utilize these funds in the 24, 25, and 25, 26 school year when the other funding sources expire. And so we're, we're just gonna take advantage of that very late sunset date. And you've seen this before, it's really our, um, our learning acceleration, the pillars of our learning acceleration support plan broken out by the various activities and the various funding sources that support the plan. And you'll see that we've added the um, educator effect on this block ground in the two out years to, to support um, the professional development. So it will continue to advance and advance the professional, com professional develop components of the learning acceleration and support plan with these dollars. And we'll continue to fill in as we get additional dollars um, in support of our plan going forward. So that's just a, a brief on what we will have before you. Thank next you, Ms. Takahashi. So, um, just uh, for clarification, can you um, speak to the item that we will have? What will actually be the item that yeah, will be so before? Yeah, so it's, us it's essentially future? a plan um, uh, for the educator effectiveness okay. block grant. Okay. And so we will have professional development. Um, uh, tied to the learning acceleration support okay. plan as its core. So this is background for what's coming, basically. Correct. Uh, any uh, thoughts, questions, colleagues? Thank you. Okay. We will move on to our business items. So let's start with our certificated personnel report, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Uh, I present the following proposed actions prepared by the S Assistant Superintendent of Human Resource Services, approved and recommended by the superintendent. I stated certificated personnel. First, appointments, 30. In service changes, 14. Uh, leaves of absence, four. Retirements, one. That's our certificated personnel. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? All right. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Classified personnel report. All right. I present the following proposed actions prepared by a super, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resource Services, approved and recommended by the superintendent. Next, we have classified and exempt personnel. Appointments, 14, uh, 114, sorry. Leaves of absence, 6. Abandonments, three. Resignations, six. And retirements, five. That's classified and exempt personnel. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Take a roll call vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes five, zero. 
Next item is board authorizations. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Um, I just wanted to mention that I noticed a lot of industrial arts um, courses that um, I haven't noticed very much in the past, so I just wanted to highlight that. It was good to see. Uh, actually, oh, here it is. Yes, <laughs> this Craig head. So um, let me just read out loud here. To teach in a subject area other than a designated credential, a teacher must complete 12 semester units in addition to a subject um, authorized for middle school. Teachers must complete 18 semester units in additional subject to be authorized. So this is for our multiple subject um, teachers, right, Ms. Uh, Dr. Baker? I'm sorry, Mr. Zay. So yes, but not just multiple subject. This also includes uh, single subjects. So this is, again, any teacher who already has a full credential. However, they're teaching in another area. And when they teach on a middle school campus, they have to have taken at least 12 semester units in the subject that they're teaching. And when they're teaching on a high school campus, at least 18 units in the subject that they're teaching. Thank you, Mr. Zaid. So any further discussion? Take a roll call vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so item 16.3 passes 5-0. Coaching assignments? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Zero. Instruct, instruction report. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Let's take a roll call vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5 0. We will move on to finance report A. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye. That passes 5-0. Finance report B. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair, I recuse myself from participation in finance report B on the consent calendar. I have a potential financial interest under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees. Any further discussion? Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0 with one abstention. 4-0. 4 with one abstention. Just checking to see if you're still here with us, Leticia. <laughs> uh, business department report. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, I would just like to thank uh, the Marathon Petroleum Foundation for their donation of $45,000 to Cabrillo. Very generous, so thank you. Any further discussion? Let's take our vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. May I also vote aye. That passes 5 0. Purchasing and contracts? We have approval. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye. That also passes 5-0. Other items, superintendent items, uh, student discipline, Dr. Baker. Thank you. Dr. Benitez and members of the board, I'm recommending expulsion of the following student. Student number 534 would be expelled under education code 48900M um, and would be, not be eligible to reapply for readmission until after June 15, 2022. However, Student Placement Services has made the recommendation that the student be expelled with a consideration for a suspended expulsion with an opportunity to attend Marshall Academy of the Arts GOC program within LBUSD. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. 
Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye. So that item passes 5-0. Unfinished business. Board policy 0415, excellence and equity. Dr. Bake, Dr. Brown, sorry. Thank you very much. This item comes back to you for your consideration this evening. The excellence and equity policy that is before you has been created by the equity leadership team. 30 individuals who have contributed as many as 30 hours of time in volunteer and support to our core mission, um, which is focused around excellence and equity. The policy reflects the sentiments of that group which also reflects the sentiments of our school district. And it comes before you for your consideration um, after lots of effort and a true sense of community engagement and back and forth dialogue. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Brown. Certainly glad to have this item back before us. We've heard it. We had a chance to hear from uh, ELT members about it, got updates from Dr. Brown on an ongoing basis. So I think now's the time to uh, first, Make I a move, motion. I move approval. <laughs> Second. And now, any discussion? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and start out. Um, I just uh, would like to thank everybody for their hard work and dedication. As you mentioned, some people put in as much as 30 hours. So um, it's always nice to have that type of commitment, especially when we're working directly with community members and volunteers. Um, um, on this very comprehensive policy. Uh, when you go through the pages, it's, um, it's a very comprehensive policy. I appreciate, I especially appreciated the glossary because that ensures we're all on the same page and it, it really exemplifies the inclusivity part of this policy at a very foundational level. So I um, appreciate that. Um, very much and then also that the practice of equity and improvement has already begun we see that work being done in our learning acceleration and support plan we have um, over the course of the last several months approved um, different uh, supplemental instructional materials that really uplift um, diverse voices so we've already begun the work but this is a nice way of formalizing the work that, that we are doing. Um, and also I wanted to share a story about the values of this board. And when we were interviewing for a new superintendent, we went through the process of, um, well, when it got down to the final applicants, of having the uh, prospective superintendents run us through an activity. And there was one particular applicant who did an exercise with the board and we were asked about what our, um, what would be the, uh, the most remarkable um, headline in a newspaper for our school district. What would be the thing, the top thing that we would be most proud of seeing and the, and the top thing that we'd like out there in the public? What would be our, our most precious value in the school district? And I wanna say each of the board members wrote down the same thing. We, we all wrote down the same thing. It was such a a proud moment. I felt, um, <laughs> I felt like I was just in the right spot at the right time. But we each wrote separately, independently of each other. Closing the achievement gap would be our best accomplishment, and I think that says a lot for the board that we are all here working for all students we want all students to succeed and for me that one moment solidified everything that's why we do what we do that's why we show up that's why we listen to the community because we want every child to succeed and this policy formalizes that in a way 
that demonstrates those values. So thank you again. Thank you to all of our volunteers who worked on this um, committee and who will continue to work on this because this is work that will be going forward. This is a starting point, not an end point. So we will continue to improve on this and follow the progress. So thank you, everyone. Good work. Thank you, Ms. Craighead. Any uh, further discussion? Uh, I can be brief. I just wanted to thank Dr. Brown and the community members who championed this process. Uh, I know that a lot of work went into it, and you said 30 plus hours. In all honesty, there's a lot of things that, the other things that people could have been doing, right? Uh, and I appreciate the uh, attention to detail that you can read in this document, the care, but most importantly, the empathy for those uh, disenfranchised communities that we, we're here to represent. So uh, I look at this document as a, <clears throat> a baseline of the values for the district to use in their decision making. And so uh, I plan to uh, not only continue to work to uphold this, but I hope that my colleagues and the rest of the district will as well. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Otto? Yeah. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to go through this document again since uh, August uh, and to look at uh, what other districts have been doing in this area. Um, my concerns in August were the possible unintended consequences of adopting a policy like this and that it might adversely affect the interests of the Long Beach Unified School District. Uh, I have gone through uh, uh, the revisions. Um, I found that uh, they were a, a, a strong step forward, that uh, they uh, helped answer many of my questions, but not all. And I am concerned about language like language that says, um, it's referring to uh, Dr. Anisha Davis, uh, of the health director of the city of Long Beach's words that um, uh, Dr. Davis' words certainly did not discover the historic concept of racism, but rather highlighted the lesser discussed public health crisis that has emerged for black, indigenous, and people of color as the daily effects of white supremacist laws and structures. Um, I think language like that sends a bad message in our community. I think I, I, am, I am a full supporter of equity. Uh, I have uh, been looking forward to the equity policy that we have been working on and um, if uh, I, I and I will support the policy if it is uh, if it's approved but I can't vote for the policy the way that it's written now uh, and uh, I make a, a commitment to continue to support the idea of equity and excellence uh, in the Long Beach Unified School District. And uh, I've had an opportunity to look at a number of different uh, school districts, equity policies, and I find us to be an outlier. And uh, I, I have carefully reviewed the California School Board Association equity policy, which I, see, which I find to be well written and uh, compelling. Uh, but I can't support this policy, so I'll be voting no. Thank Mr. You. Otto, if I may, um, I appreciate the perspective you've offered. I wanted to add some context to the comment. Uh, the comment that you referenced by Dr. Davis is not a part of the policy. The comment that you've referenced is a part of the memo that corresponds with the policy, and the intent was to set some historical context around the year that has been 2020 and some of the new ways of bringing forward and thinking about the impact of racism as a part of institutions everywhere. And so I wanted to specifically highlight, not to be responsive to the opinion that you've offered, but to just correct the fact that that is in fact not a part of the policy. It is a part of the corresponding narrative that goes with the policy. Thank you. Um, I it was unclear to me whether this was part of what we were adopting, but my opinion remains. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Uh, any further discussion? Yeah, I just um, will add to the chorus of thanks, and I know people wonder sometimes why we, we, we do the choruses of thanks, but it, for us it's really important um, 
to acknowledge the work that went into this. And really, I would say the work, um, Dr. Baker used the phrase earlier, of co-creating this policy in a unique way. Um, we um, can be given templates of policies. We get policies in front of us in different ways. We're mandated by um, state constitution or education code. And this was a unique process by which we asked the public and asked um, our community to help us acknowledge, recognize, and put forth steps um, to do better, and I want to thank all of the people who are a part of that process because I know it was not just the hours that were put into the, you know, it's not just about the time, it's about the content of those hours, which um, when they came and spoke to us and presented to us, and you have updated us as well, Dr. Brown, um, are emotionally engaging. Um, they can be hard to hear. They can be triggering for some based on their own life experiences. And I'm so grateful for the community for bringing that, to bring, coming together to do that work on our behalf for the benefit of this community and this school district. So I'm really, really grateful. Um, and I just wanted to read, it's in case people aren't reading all of the pages of our uh, agenda. These initiatives have been developed to bring focus to the goals of the superintendent, as well as create data-driven practices that will frame the work of our next LBUSD strategic plan. And it talks about details. Um, this isn't just a policy that sits on paper. These are action steps. They are pieces of information and reminders about how we will go about all of our work in this district. And I'm really grateful um, for being given the parameters to continue to do this work in such an innovative and important way. So uh, thank you to the team, and I look forward to voting yes. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kerr. So I, I want to uh, build on Dr. Brown's uh, comments. So as with all resolutions and policies that uh, our district considers, there's context. Um, policies and resolutions don't just magically appear. Uh, out of thin air. There's context, there's background, there's stories. And then there's process on how it ultimately gets to our board. I think as with, and I've shared this before, as, as with any resolution or policy that we have the opportunity to consider, that just as important as the words uh, in policies and or resolutions, um, is how we hold ourselves accountable to those words and resolutions and policies. And holding ourselves accountable requires context. We need to hold ourselves accountable to something. And without that context, the words then become very difficult to uphold. And it becomes even more important then to be very concrete as to what we're going to hold ourselves accountable to, to be true to the words and the intent and expected outcomes in policies. So I want to highlight and uplift um, being respectful to everything that's been shared today that we just finished celebrating Native American History Month. That didn't come from thin air. That didn't come from one day someone deciding, oh, let's do this. There's a context behind why we celebrate, why we educate, why we commit to the values that all of us here have shared. And the only way to hold ourselves accountable and this is why this board is here, for three reasons. For policy, budget, we need resources for these policies, and to hold our superintendent accountable to the things that we say we value, to the things that anchor our values, which is policies, and to the systems that require resources to implement policies. And that's the nuts and bolts without getting into a lecture on how a bill becomes a law schoolhouse rock uh, here. 
But I think this provides a tool for us. The words by themselves are insufficient. Necessary, but insufficient. And the tools provide us three additional avenues. One is to continue doing those things that we do well, that we have been doing. To do additional things that we should be doing according to those values, the visions, the priorities that we set. But also to recognize that we need to change other things. Not necessarily specifically that Long Beach has done, but the context that we are a part of a public education system in this country that we can learn from things that our systems, our institutions, in hindsight, and perhaps during that time when these were going on, we would do differently. And I think this policy, as it reads, comes back to us from what I heard from the actual members of that ELT team that helped to produce this policy for us to consider, all anchored their commitment to working on this ELT, on the values that we've expressed, but on the notion of accountability to those values. So this policy is necessary for us to continue doing those things that we do well, do those things that we say are important to us to achieve the equitable student success that we desire, and change those things that we could do better. So I uh, strongly suggest that we consider that when we take our vote. Any further discussion? Okay, let's take a roll call vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? No. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that policy passes 4-1. We will move on to new business. Board policy 0410, non-discrimination in district programs and activities. Mr. Zaid. Thank you. As you're aware, board policies are periodically reviewed to ensure that they are updated to reflect the recent legislation changes or changes in the law. Over the next several board meetings, you will be asked to review and approve several other policies related to equity and non-discrimination uh, that will be updated. The three before you were last updated in 2017. And so the changes you will see throughout the policy are updates to non-discrimination language, such as the inclusion of immigration status, ethnic group, marital status, sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, genetic information, um, and additional information on equity. Other changes that will be reflected include the publishing of the contact information for the coordinator of non-discrimination and employment, which is myself, ADA coordinators, which are various staff, our Title IX coordinator and UCP compliance officer, Kim Dalton, and a new role of equity compliance officer, which will be filled by Steve Rockenbach. These compliance and coordinator roles support the district in ensuring compliance with uh, federal and state laws and regulations governing our educational programs. Just to talk about uh, some of the tools that we use, when we are making updates to our board policies, we utilize the California School Boards Association sample policies to compare. We also um, take a look at the current legislation regarding these policies. Another helpful tool that we use is the Education Equity Program, which is an instrument put out by the California Department of Education. And so we use all three of these tools, compare it to our current policy, and then we look for where updates are needed. And so the three recommendations that you have before you reflect uh, those policy uh, updates according to the changes in legislation and uh, new laws. So Mr. Zay, thank you. Uh, um, quick clarification before we entertain sure. a, a motion. So are we voting for 19.1, 19.2, 19.3 separately or collectively? Separately. Okay, thank you. Now I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. 
Okay, so we're voting on non-discrimination in district programs and activities first. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Board policy 4030, non-discrimination in employment. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Okay, let's take a vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye. That passes 5-0. Uh, next, board policy 5145.3, non-discrimination harassment of students. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye. That passes 5-0. Next item is resolution number 12012-A-A, sorry. Uh, resolution of the Governing Board of Long Beach Unified School District designating specific material, product, things, or services for use at Wilson High School and Lakewood High School pursuant to Public Contract Code Section 3400C1. Uh, Mr. Miranda, I know you covered uh, some of this already. Additional information that you'd like to share specific to uh, this recommendation. Dr. Benitez, I'm going to tell the story and provide a little context on this resolution as well. So first and foremost, public contract code section 3400 really governs what we do with respect to public bidding requirements and what we need to do on projects in terms of not limiting bidders, uh, not limiting certain products we're able to use on specific public works projects. Uh, however, sec section 3400 subsection C1 um, allows us to to go around this effort, really it makes it inapplicable uh, provided we call for a field test. And that's what we're doing here. So we did quite a bit of research, extensive research um, performed by the facilities and maintenance teams here in Long Beach. We visited a number of um, sites, both public and private, bu privately built facilities and pool complexes. Um, visited um, swimming pool recent installs over at Wiseburn and Glendale Unified. Uh, also visited some other local pro project sites on the private side of the house as well. Looked at projects uh, that this particular supplier recently built, but also looked at pools that were built in the more traditional fashion, which would be reinforced concrete, uh, just to be able to, to really gauge and, and sample the two. What we were looking to do here, and the reason we developed this recommendation, is we're looking for the best product, right? So uh, our students, our staff, our community at large really deserves nothing but the best. Uh, we have an opportunity here to develop uh, this type of project and, and do it right. And really what we hear out there just in terms of our, our research and the folks we talk to, including our counterparts and neighboring districts, is this product is in fact up there at the top. So not only has it been built uh, in, in several cases throughout the state and across the nation and, and really the world for that matter, it's used as the primary product for Olympic events as well, right? So it's, it's really at the top. Um, it's a stainless steel, modular panel um, type product, 100% customizable. Uh, we like the fact that it's been deemed UV, algae and chemical resistant. Um, it really just comes with a, a durable, long lasting um, lifespans. And that's what we hear even on some of the older installs as well. So it, it's really known as one of the best products. Uh, we wanna develop a field test here so we can sample it over at Wilson and Lakewood those are the first two aquatic centers in terms of the, the aquatic centers we're, we're setting out to build across the comprehensive high schools. Uh, but this field test will allow us, in fact, to determine if it's a suitable project going, a product going forward uh, for the additional installs. Uh, we also project substantial cost savings, right? So if we're able to identify one, one particular product, uh, this tub as we call it, uh, we can then use it across multiple sites. We can have that continuity from a maintenance standpoint, uh, but there's also cost savings, right? Uh, just in using the same product uh, repeatedly. Uh, so with that, we want to recommend uh, moving forward with this resolution, uh, which really just allows us to, to go with a field test at these two particular locations. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, just one quick question about the material. Does it impact our sustainability efforts in any way? It, it, it's actually um, really in a positive light, 
So they also check the box in terms of being an environment of environmentally friendly product, um, perhaps more so than what we would have done in a traditional sense with concrete and plaster. Thank you. Board Member Kirk. Yeah, I want to thank you for acknowledging uh, the issues around maintenance as well. So we have pools across the district that were built at different times many decades ago, and we know that um, the pool attendants have become quite specialized in maintaining and making sure the pools are operable. So I appreciate the effort to um, make that a little more system wide so that if for some reason someone wasn't at work one day that there's familiarity um, across the district to be able to make sure that our pools are usable for all our kids. Thank you for that. Thank you. Board Member Otto. Sure. Um, Mr. Miranda, you said the tub. Does this have to do with we're going to try and work with the tubs uh, for, the, for the pools themselves? So is, that, is that what we're looking at? So this is really, I use tub really as a point of reference. Uh, right. So it's really just the product, uh, really the shell uh, of the pool itself. Right, the shell of the pool itself. It Correct. has nothing to do with the locker rooms. Correct. It has nothing to do with the changing uh, uh, areas. It has nothing to do with the design or the way that the, uh, uh, the well, the, that the, the projects will, will go forward, that's separate and later, is that right? Correct, nothing whatsoever, this is exterior, it's where we'll fill the water. Got it, okay, thank you. Mr. Miranda, I'm gonna just test your <laughs> expertise here. I'm, I'm interested in the wording of the resolution. Uh, it points to materials, products, things, or services. Can you give us an example of a thing that wouldn't be considered a material product uh, or service? You know, the funny thing is so many of our resolutions on the facility side of the house are very wordy. So I commend you for sticking through it and reading the entire thing. Uh, with this particular case, we really use the language re required of us by public contract Got code, it. right? So with this particular subsection C1, it. it requires us to frame it this exact way. In some cases, it would be a product. In other cases, it might be a specific material or thing. Um, in, in our world, it's often a product or an actual supply. Yeah. I know that's just a <laughs> long answer for you're going to get back to me on a thing that's a not thing. a product I'll, or I'll a find, service, right, I'll Mr. find Ryan. a thing or we'll come back and actually recommend a thing as a future resolution. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Miranda. You Thank know, you. that 68-page PDF <laughs> attached may have talked about a things. Thing. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Let's take our vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Thank you. Next item is resolution number 120121-B, a resolution of the Governing Board of Education of the Long Beach Unified School District of intention to convey property interest for public street purposes to the California Department of Transportation for the construction of pedestrian and bicyclist safety improvements and things. I'm just playing on the last <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? <laughs> Thanks. Let's uh, take our roll call vote. Mr. Otto, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that item passes 5-0. Next item is 19.6, to which we uh, uh, change one word out. This is resolution number 120121-C, a resolution of the Board of Education of the Long Beach Unified School District recommending new board education districts for the Long Beach Unified School District to the City of Long Beach and authorizing staff to take action actions necessary to implement the provisions of this resolution. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Just can, sure. can you... Uh, sure. Cue us up, sure. Ms. Takahashi. Sure. Great. So we are very grateful to be at this point and be at a point or in a position of recommending a board district map to you for your approval this evening. Just as background for our process, we know that after every census, which is every 10 years, we have to review the population data to determine if voting areas are still within the allowable 10%. Um, variance and make any necessary adjustments. Um, the 2020 census data revealed a 14% uh, 
variance between District 5, the most populous district, and least populous District 3. Therefore, some line drawing was necessary. Um, we provided three maps um, for board and community um, a review on October 20th, and considerations in drafting the maps were that each area um, had um, a population within the allowable variance um, drawn to comply with federal voting rights, uh, respectful of communities of interest, following human made and natural geographic features, um, compact and contiguous, and not favoring or discriminating against a political party. So community feedback was the pillar of this process and we employed multiple means and strategies of, of gaining public input into this process. So we deployed a redistricting website uh, that provided information, uh, which had uh, the various presentations, the maps with live comparisons, FAQ, as well as a great explainer video. Uh, community surveys, we had two community surveys. Um, the community of interest survey that launched the process with 189 responses, and then the scenario map survey, which garnered 122 responses. We held two district uh, community events. Um, we presented at five district community meetings and provided information on redistricting and uh, participated at four community events. Um, we sent out postcards, 40,000 postcards to the LBSD community asking for feedback on, the uh, on redistricting as well as advertise a process on social media and sent out school messenger messages. So just for context, these are our current Board of Education districts and these are the accompanying demographics for the current board districts so the total population is 518,668 um, with ideal um, board district size of 103,734 um, um, and again the population variance was 14 percent um, so uh, there was a latinx um, Plurality shown in districts one, two, and three, according to the citizen voting age population data, and this is upheld in the proposed map. So the, the map that we are proposing to you was scenario two, or map two, um, as it reflects the community's uh, desire to keep neighborhoods and cities together. Some strong themes that emerged from the community of interest survey and the map feedback survey was the desire to keep city uh, Signal Hill together within one board area. Um, other strong feedback that we got was the importance of keeping Bixby Knowles, Los Cerritos, and California Heights within one board area, and a desire to keep the Cambodian community together in one board area. So here is uh, the proposed map. So this is map two. And here are the accompanying demographics. Um, to map two, we show a 7.6% variance. Um, and again, the largest Latinx plurality is in District 1. And again, maintains the Latinx plurality, pluralities in Districts 1, 2, and 3. Here are the changes um, to some of the lines um, in the, um, with the proposed map. And here, we're honing in on the affected areas. So here, all of Willow Springs and Signal Hill would go um, from District um, uh, Four to District um, to District District Four to District Two. Um, next one: Los Altos South and Stearns Park areas affected, um, with um, bounded by four or five to the north and the east, Stearns and Atherton to the south, and Lakewood to the west. And from District 2 to District 3, um, the rest of the Wilmore and St. Mary's areas um, with Anaheim to the north, 7th Street to the south, and Alamitos to the east. And so our next steps, if approved uh, this evening, they'll be s the map will be submitted to the City of Long Beach for approval. And then uh, the City Council, with City Council approval, the map will be submitted to the LA County to implement the voting precincts for the June 7th primary elections. So as we conclude, we'd just really like to thank the community for joining us on this journey and who have um, taken their time and shared their feedback with us. 
and, and thank you to our community partners who have really partnered with us um, in the outreach for this effort. So at this point. Thank you, Ms. Takahashi. Questions, yeah. Uh, any questions or comments from my colleagues? Hmm. Mr. Miller? Uh, I recognize that uh, over the past, I think, 30 days, you heard from my colleagues here a strong interest in wanting to see uh, uh, comments and input from the community, and I will say that you, I stepped up to the call. I, I saw the numbers continuously grow. I think at the end, they grew exponentially. Uh, I went through the comments and read uh, them thoroughly. I saw a heavy interest in folks wanting to keep Bixby Knowles and Cal Heights together, which is in my district here. So I just appreciate the uh, level of interest and the level of effort you all put to making sure that we got community input. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Mr. Otto? Yeah, I, I uh, watch carefully the development of these options and then the arguments made in favor of the different options. And in particular, uh, I uh, was watching closely um, uh, what the comments were that, that came in and the, and the outreach, which I commend the district on, that what they did, and uh, I really made an effort. Um, I, in my area, I had virtually no comments at all about changes which were reflected in any of the three possible maps, and um, that gave me some comfort. I think that the reasons that are advanced for the adoption of the particular recommendation, which include keeping Signal Hill together as an area, uh, well, uh, a laudable goal is sad to me because I represented him and I won't represent him anymore, uh, but that's to the benefit of Signal Hill. Likewise, uh, the community of interest standard uh, that applies uh, in an analysis like this uh, means that the, the neighborhoods of, for example, Bixby Knowles, Cal Heights, and uh, areas in that area uh, stand together. There's a, there are historical reasons for doing that. In fact, I was involved in uh, creating the, uh, the Cal Heights Historic District, and, uh, and there is a lot to be said for keeping uh, neighborhoods together. And uh, so I, I think that's another re reason that, that, these, uh, that, that these recommendations are a good one, and I'm very supportive of what the out outcome has been. Doug, just so you know, I'll take care of your Signal Hill residents for you. And you can feel free to visit them at any time, okay? I'd, I'd, I'd like monthly reports if that's okay. I, you should idea. jog up together while you're having the monthly reports. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Um, I would just like to go on record as saying I, I stand to have five fewer schools in the 5th District and that makes me sad because I've enjoyed <laughs> representing them, but I understand it's um, for the greater good, but I just want to say I'm going to be very sad not to be representing those five particular schools. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Ms. Kerr. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Takahashi and the team for a really robust process. Um, a lot of us who were actively engaged in doing things around the district the last time this happened, um, I've talked to several folks and we have very little recollection of what it was like and how that vote went down. So I want to thank you for um, a robust process over multiple meetings um, and all of the, the community outreach that you did around this um, in a way that is, as if I, in all of my remembering, is pretty unprecedented. So thank you uh, for your efforts and the team uh, that did the work. Thank you, and, and I would just add my thanks to, to the team and to the community partners and community members that participated in our process, uh, understanding the challenges involved with involving community members, educating community members, and then um, adhering to the tight timelines uh, that we had. Um, so uh, I appreciate the recommendation uh, for map number two, particularly uh, because um, of the importance that map number two reflects in terms of our race and ethnic uh, subgroups. 
um, the importance of the overall total population balance. I mean, we went from a 14% variance to seven. The importance of the CVAP, or citizen voting age population uh, balance, and of course the importance of our communities of interest. And my colleagues here have already spoken to how this map upholds uh, that both by keeping Signal Hill together, neighborhoods together, uh, our Cambodian community uh, together. So I appreciate uh, the recommendation of map number two. I wanna say a couple more things. As has already been referenced, this goes to our city council colleagues. So I um, encourage them to listen uh, to what has been discussed here as we approve, uh, uh, as we take action, I should say, on a map uh, tonight uh, to help inform then their decision on um, approving whatever we move forward uh, tonight. Uh, lastly, and I reference the challenges with the timeline and community involvement, um, and I know I was hard on the team, uh, Mr. Grayson, Mr. Suarez, Ms. Takahashi, on the importance of community engagement, uh, but really uh, what we were setting to do here was to build on the foundation for community engagement, for our ongoing community engagement efforts and future community engagement efforts. So um, those visits out to Franklin and the Thanksgiving dinner giveaway, uh, Justin, and, and, and the, the various other events, activities, and um, relationships with community partners um, have ongoing and long-term payoffs for us in terms of our commitment to community engagement. So thank you for that. Um, with that said, any further discussion? I have a quick question about the timeline. Uh, do we have an idea as to when the city council will be approving this? December 7th, it will be before the city council. December 7th? December 7th. Yes, that's next Tuesday's council meeting. Okay, yes. next, and then um, would it immediately go into effect or how long before it would go into effect? So it would be in effect um, upon approval by the city council. So that's so when I'd lose my five schools? So we will. Next week? <laughs> I was gonna say something, but I'll, I won't say it. <laughs> Are you going to say it for me, Doug? Um, you tell me if I, if I okay. say it when okay. I say it, okay? Um, Mr. Otto. Okay. So um, it's important that it be done right away, and one of the uh, non-obvious reasons is that if people are going to move into these districts or be in these districts at the time uh, that, that they, have to, they have to make decisions, that has to happen very, very quickly because the, uh, the schedule uh, albeit different than what the long charter for the city of Long Beach says, uh, will be, you have to be someplace by, I, I think, is it Mar sometime in March uh, in a district? Do you got to be there at least, or is it 30 days before the, the election? Uh, I, I don't remember what the exact rule is, but uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, th once these maps are adopted, these new district things are done, then all kinds of political things happen. And it's not just that we're gonna have an election in June, uh, uh, it's, it's that people move into places and start making decisions and it's a very intense thing. So uh, I'm glad that we were, we were able to get this done in a, in a quick way. We pulled it off, that's right. Uh, any further discussion? Let's take our vote, Mr. Otto. And again, we're voting on recommendation for district, uh, proposed district map number two. Correct. Thank you. Mr. Otto. Aye. Ms. Craighead. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. And then how does that get make its way over to our city council, Ms. Takahashi? We have made arrangements to submit it to them tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. Report of board members. Um, let's start with Mr. Otto. Oh, um, this is a, a big agenda today and uh, a lot that reflects a lot of work that's been done by the district over a, a very long period of time. I want my uh, colleagues on the board to 
know that um, I will support the equity and excellence policy that we've adopted, that I think, and as I said, I, I agree with it. I had concerns that, allowed, that did not allow me to vote in, in favor of it um, that I won't elaborate on at this point, but uh, uh, it's the adopted policy and I think it's the responsibility of uh, the board to, uh, to act on those on, on adopted policies and to follow them and I will work uh, steadfastly to make sure that this is implemented. And in fact, um, the, I guess the, the only comment that I really want to make uh, uh, in this comment period is that um, uh, we, you know, we, we've, got a, we've got an obligation uh, to do this and that it's all, will all be in the implementation. That uh, the way it's implemented and it's laid out in the policy uh, uh, means that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to put this together and, uh, and the proof will be in the pudding to get this done because there's a lot there. So that's all. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Ms. Craighead? Well, I'll start out by saying Happy Hanukkah. Um, and then I'm going to go back in time a little bit and extend the season of giving thanks. I think it's always the right time uh, for gratitude and um, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, shop with a cop program um, not too long ago 100 of our uh, or approximately 100 of our Webster elementary students went shopping with our um, LBPD cops <clears throat> and uh, were treated to a, a shopping spree and I appreciate that um, I also want to highlight a couple of teachers that I feel go above and beyond for their students. And one teacher is Jordan, Jordan teacher um, Jody Irish. I was um, recently at um, Jordan for the uh, Camarado Singers concert, and I when I went in the auditorium. And it, it was my first time being in the auditorium for um, an event since the, you know, refurbishment and it's gorgeous. And I went up the elevator. Um, I get special treatment where I go. I'm just kidding. But um, I went up the elevator and when I walked out of the elevator on the second floor, it looked like I was at the Terrace Theater or the Beverly O'Neill Theater. It, it looked like I was at... A different theater. I mean, it had this feel to it that was um, very bougie, and there was nice furniture and everything. In a good way, right, Miss Craighead? In a very, in the okay. best way. In the best way. Does that have a bad? I'm, I don't know what young people say, but I'm just kind of throwing words out there. Um, and so I later found out, and there was a beautiful furniture in the um, lobby area. I found out Jody Irish brought furniture from her house. And she also made arrangements with a friend of hers that does events. And she brought in furniture um, just for the uh, second floor lobby area. And um, she had spent the day before with um, oh another uh, with uh, somebody else who was helping her out. Mm, and now I'm blanking on her name. Anyhow, but thank you. They worked on flowers. They did flower arrangements so that when you went into the restroom, there were gorgeous flower arrangements in the restroom, in the lobby area. They put in their own time. They worked several hours on a Saturday to prepare for an event on Sunday. And I'll tell you, I, I walked out with people who are not from Long Beach, and they were so impressed with Jordan, and they were so impressed with the theater there um, and everything that had gone on. It, it was wonderful. Um, I also want to express gratitude for a Wilson teacher, um, Ted Hollister. I don't know if you're familiar with Mr. Hollister. Um, there are YouTube videos available, I'm sure. He created a program called More for Students because I think it was about three years ago, maybe three, four years ago, he found out that a student in his classroom was homeless. And he immediately went into action. Oh my gosh, if I have a student in my classroom who's homeless, there must be other kids at school that are homeless or having a hard time. We've got to be able to do more for students. And so literally, he creates a program called 
more for students, and he encouraged his colleagues to donate money out of their paychecks on a monthly basis. And what they do is they buy food, they buy toiletries, hygiene products, um, they've done gift cards, uh, all sorts of things. When they find out a family is in need, they help out that family. They are making a difference. And this is from Mr. Hollister. This is, this, this is uh, demonstrating how one person can make a huge difference in the lives of our students. And I would encourage all of our other uh, high schools to have a look at what's going on at, at Wilson, have a look at um, what Mr. Hollister's been able to do, and find out how we can do this at all of our high schools, because we've, we've got to be able to um, pitch in. And so I'd love to hear from the high schools that I represent, you know, Millican, Lakewood, McBride. I, I want to be able to help. I want to be able to be a part of that movement that is helping our kids. And honestly, these are just two of the teachers that we have in our district, just two of the teachers I wanted to talk about and let them know that um, they are very much appreciated the difference they make in the lives of their students has a ripple effect and it benefits all of us. So just thank you to those uh, special teachers and everybody else out there who's doing that kind of work. Thank you, Ms. Craighead. And I will interpret bougie in, in the way that I think of the stylish way that Mr. Zaitz sports those <laughs> bow ties once in a while. Okay, then I think I got it right. Right? I think I did. Right. Mr. Miller. <laughs> I was caught a little bit off guard with that one. Uh, so give me a second. Uh, well, yes, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, today was a really full agenda uh, in regards to um, the role that we sign up for in regards to impacting the long-term success of our students in regards to the equity policy, uh, some uh, big decisions around the way that we spend. So it's, it was a very full agenda, to say the least. Um, on reg in regards to things that are going on in my district, first, I wanted to give a special shout out to Long Beach Poly football team, of course. They kicked butt again and took some names. I uh, was joking with my wife. I was like, so I've been to maybe four of the poly games thus far, and I think I've seen a total of about 14 points scored by the opposing team. So I'm like, I might be the good luck charm. They probably can't score when I'm there. So anyway, um, uh, but they have an exciting game uh, this Friday, Saturday, uh, at Sarah at 7.30. So uh, definitely excited for them. And Sarah's a tough team. So uh, looking forward to them continuing their success and moving on to the next round. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about a pretty popular activity that happens in my district, which is the Long Beach Daisy Parade, hosted by Council Member Yoranga. Uh, uh, it is our little piece of the holiday season over there on the west side, and so it's uh, a good time for families to come out and see some fancy lights and get some treats, and so uh, anyone who's interested in uh, spending a few hours uh, with their family this weekend on December 4th, uh, feel free to come out to Daisy, and if I'm not mistaken, it's Burnett is where the parade starts, and uh, check out some pretty cool uh, floats that come by. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I think I rarely talk to the students from the dais because I don't imagine that they're here, but maybe we have a few parents that are uh, watching today, and so when I, uh, I'm a mentor, like I've shared with you all before, and I've mentored hundreds of kids before this and every time that I look at this period of the school year I probably need to stop doing this as I look at everything like a freaking sport right I look at it like sports and so right now for students I consider this like a basketball game it's the fourth quarter and in a basketball game in the fourth quarter that's where you put a little bit more energy that's where you follow through that's where you finish the game that's where the game's won and lost so for our students that are doing okay academically and are 
maybe even behind on some things. Recognize this is the fourth quarter. This is that time period where it's time to step up, time to do those extra things so that you can achieve that grade that you've been working really hard to get. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Ms. Kerr. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to take my board report time today to lift up and honor Jordan High School and the Jordan High School football program. That's right. So they had their best football season in school history, which is 80 years. Um, they were 2-2 two and two in the preseason, 3-3 three and three in Moore League with victories over Compton, Wilson, and Cabrillo. They went 3-1 and one in the postseason. It was the first time they've won a playoff game since 1994. First time they've made it to the second round of the playoffs, and the first time they made it to the championships in their 80 years. So um, it's been an incredible run. So special thanks to Tim Wedlow, coach, assistant coaches Dave Ferguson, Alejandro Franco, Vic Robinson, Tiant Spears, Marty Wedlow, and to our team captains, uh, three seniors, Elijah Jones, King Manukola, ah, Manukola, who's a senior, Jerry McGurn, Jeremy McGurn, who's a senior, and Jacob Hernandez, who is a junior. We have some amazing seniors um, that we will miss, but we also have some pretty spectacular uh, younger players on the team. So there is so much more to come from Jordan's football program and their basketball program, which is kicking off as well. But I want to give special thanks to the North Long Beach community for lifting them up, for supporting them, especially the alumni from every decade who traveled to Irvine to go to this game. I saw folks from the 70s, the 80s. I saw um, a cheer megaphone from 77 and Letterman's jackets from the 80s and the 00s. And so to all of the alumni who rallied around this young team, thank you so much. I was on campus on Monday and the air is just electric. They're so grateful uh, for everyone's involvement and re-engagement with them. They want to make you proud. They are very proud of themselves. Also a shout out to Vice Mayor Rex Richardson, who's always been a great supporter of the school. Um, he was out at the games cheering on the sidelines and he also sponsored tickets. Uh, he and I both sponsored tickets for the playoff game, the semifinal game and the final game. Um, and so he's out there cheering for our great community. So I uh, beg you to stay engaged with them. They want to see you out on campus at their games. Uh, Ms. Keisha Irving is doing spectacular work as a new principal there. Um, her team, Rachel and Michelle, and all of the Jordan uh, faculty who travel and support such a great event, I just want to say congratulations. We are so, so proud of you. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Uh, I mean, scholar athletes, what more can you say, uh, right? Uh, so I'm going to just condense my comments here around um, the spirit of uh, the holiday season and around gratitude and, and grace and, and really take a moment to acknowledge um, and express gratitude for the many community organizations that make Long Beach great, that uh, are always there for our community members um, during these difficult times for many of our community members. And um, in particular, those community organizations that are doing incredible work around health equity in our district, incredible work uh, around food security in our district. Um, work with us, offering to help us um, with our mission, uh, including those groups that stepped up during our redistricting uh, efforts. Um, those organizations uh, are based on mostly volunteers you talked about mentoring, uh, Mr. Miller. Um, we've had events um, from everywhere at, at our schools to the Museum of Latin American Art in collaboration with our city, uh, with our own partners that um, oftentimes get sporadic acknowledgement on social media, uh, but are, have been in it for the long haul. And I think during this holiday season, um, as we celebrate and thank in our own way, I just want to acknowledge the many, many community organizations, community groups that make our work more possible, um, both in the spirit of formal partnership, but just as allies uh, in our efforts to empower our students, our families, our community members. Thank you. 
uh, to all of the organizations. And it's too many to um, list or remember, but many of you will be hearing from us very soon around our community engagement efforts and our shared governance uh, here. So be on the lookout, more information to come on that, and, and I'll keep my, my board report to that uh, tonight. Superintendent report, Dr. Baker. Thank you. I'm going to just build on a few things that have been shared and then share a few other things. So the first thing I want to do is just acknowledge our college and career center, in particular the advisors who run those college and career centers. So this last week, as you've heard from many of our students, was a major deadline for um, UC and CSU applications as well as early um, decision. Those college and career centers were open last week. In, in addition to the advisors, there were many other staff members um, supporting students and getting all of their applications finished. So I don't, I don't want that to go unnoticed. Um, behind the scenes, when a lot of people were resting and enjoying the holiday, we had a lot of staff supporting our students. So thank you to those, those staff. And I'm just going to build on the poly. I, I got to attend both Poly High School and Jordan's games last week. Um, and I loved listening to the alumni. In fact, I had many around me telling the stories of when they were in school, which I love. But most importantly, I just want to lift up our students who were there to cheer each other on at both games. And, and it was really neat to see. So board member Kerr, thank you for your donation of tickets, along with Rex Richardson, Al Austin, Mr. Miller, making sure that poly students had transportation on the bus um, to go cheer their team on. So really, really wonderful to be a part of that. Um, and just want to add my thanks to Yumi, to James Suarez, to Justin Rich, um, to Justin Grayson, and other staff from Equity Engagement and Partnerships. It's been said already, but this is redistricting occurs once every 10 years. And so the work that has gone on starting, I remember an early conversation with Yumi, probably back in May or June, about what was coming. Um, and she, you know, she said, I'll do it. It's not a typical role for a CBFO to do redistrict, to lead a redistricting effort in a, in a school district, but she has done a phenomenal job with really good support. Justin Rich can't be here tonight, um, but he was a, he was a um, very integral part of this, and I know he's appreciated. And I just want to add, Dr. Benitez, to what you said. So redistricting was an opportunity for new partnerships, for new relationships, and while the data may not reflect that in all, um, what I've seen is Dr. Salazar and Justin Grayson forming new partnerships and relationships and just advancing those relationships that we already have. And so just specifically want to call out AOC7 and Long Beach Forward. You didn't name them specifically, Dr. Benitez, but they have been with us and really helped us to have community partnership in the redistricting effort. Two other things. Um, I don't want to let the moment pass of an excellence and equity policy without acknowledging Dr. Brown and the equity leadership team who hopefully they're listening tonight for the comments that have been shared and to see this policy be passed. I'm thinking back to the summer of 2020. It's a really hard time in our nation and a really hard time in our city. It was um, following the murder of George Floyd um, and a citywide effort around reconciliation. Our city, Dr. Benitez, you were a part of that. Long Beach City College wrote, rec um, wrote resolutions of reconciliation. You allowed us the space to bring stakeholders in and to think about policy from a very long standing perspective. It's not that we didn't want to reconcile at that time, but you gave the space to create a, a, um, a long term plan and a way to engage our stakeholders in relationship that I think is taking us into the next generation of work in Long Beach Unified School District. And so um, your approval of the policy codifies a commitment to excellence and equity, which have to go together in the way that we think about what we want for our students, excellence and equity. And so thank, thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Brown and equity leadership team for what you've brought forth to this board. Lastly, I got to attend the Renaissance, the first performance in their new theater on Saturday the 20th, heading into the, the break, and it was just a joyful experience to, again, sit in beautiful space downtown Long Beach to see students performing and to feel proud. They performed in their masks. They didn't care. They danced. They sang. The sound was great. Their families cheered, and it was a really great way to start the Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving break. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, do we have any announcements, colleagues?
Ms. Kerr, I believe you wanted to share something. I do. Uh, I have one announcement. Uh, I I'm inviting you to the beautiful renovated Jordan Auditorium. Um, oh, shoot. On Friday, December 9th, I think it is. I had it pulled up, and I only wrote that it's at 6 o'clock. If so, if someone could check, and we'll make sure to advertise. Friday's the 10th, thank you. For their winter spectacular Christmas concert, which is a great, big, huge student, inclusive student performance with students uh, from special education, students with disabilities, uh, students from all over the school lifting each other up. It is a glorious event. I'm not sure if they're doing a daytime show, they're working on that, but please head to Jordan for that winter concert spectacular. Um, and if we have no more announcements, I'd like to close that's okay. Uh, so, uh, so we'll make the motion right now as you're speaking to adjourn. Oh, okay. So I will make the motion to adjourn in honor of World AIDS Day. Annually on December 1st, we commemorate World AIDS Day and reflect upon our worldwide response to the HIV AIDS epidemic. This year is especially poignant as we mark 40 years since the first five cases of what later became known as AIDS were officially reported. We honor more than 36 million people including 700,000 in the United States who have died from AIDS-related illness globally since the start of the epidemic. On this day, we reflect on those we have lost to AIDS. We honor the nearly 38 million people living with HIV, and we renew our commitment to work with our diverse stakeholder communities to end the HIV epidemic across the United States and around the world. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. That concludes our meeting. Our next meeting is December 15th. Have a good night, everyone.